Do people do, do no puppies? Bees, bees, no bees? Bees. Bees, bees, yeah. Bees, no bees, no bees, yeah. No bees, yeah. No bees. No bees. No bees. It's, good to, it's good to get a jump on it before, just to get information for the spring. I don't recommend, highly recommend getting bees this late in the year. There can be problems trying to keep them alive during the winter months when we have to feed them and, uh, and other pest problems. So uh, jump in if you got questions anytime because it's just going to be learning another language for you, as we all know. Um, and we're all re registered with beekeepers with the state. Uh, we have a Facebook page and uh, we do also have a website for trying to share information with everybody on. Um, did anybody make it over? We had the Bee Lab open in Gainesville this last month. Did anybody make it over to the opening? A couple people? It's great. Fabulous facility. It's um, world class. It's going to be a really an amazing place for research in the state of Florida, for the southeast and the U.S. in general. Um, it's really a neat thing. We've got the Bee College coming up here, which is going to be on the 12th and 13th of this month. So I hope people are signing up for that. Right now it capped out at 350 people. Normally it doesn't cap out. Um, it, it, it filled up so rapidly that they had another people, 100 people on the wait list. It's actually going to be on a Monday and Tuesday of the following week. So it's actually been extended to the 15th and 16th of uh, October, which is really a big, huge plus. We've also got the Caribbean Bee College coming up in November 26th through the 30th in Freeport. Um, it'll be a little bit smaller venue. It won't be as big as the one in Gainesville with, with 350 people, obviously. It'll be still, uh, we have about six instructors going down there for that, and I'll be participating in that as well. Uh, next month, we've got, uh, next couple days here, October 4th, we've got a little flyer here. Diane Spoden, who just did the beginner's class, is going to do something at uh, Ormond Beach Art Museum. She's going to do a little talk on that. I could send this around from each direction. It's at 11 o'clock, the Thursday at 11 in the morning. It's more for the public than for beekeeping. It's, yeah, it's more of a general talk on beekeeping, just kind of let everybody know what's going on down there. But So we are trying to get out and do extension programs within our group here. Uh, last month we had a uh, Mike Run, I don't know if anybody picked up on him on Facebook. He was doing tattoos. They had the Jacksonville Tattoo Convention going on up at World Golf Village. Um, and Mike is a tattoo artist. I'm not familiar with him. But he decided to have a cause. And he decided this, that he was going to donate, do a bee tattoo on Fridays. And all the funds would go to our association here. And he was able to come up with a, a check for us for $280. Wow. For I was pretty impressed with, so we're going to put that toward use within the group here. Can we um, see your uh, tattoo? I didn't. I didn't get one. I, <laughs> my mom's still alive. <laughs> I get a spanking for sure. So, um, but Holly got a real nice. Holly got one. She missed it. She was out of town that day, so she got a real nice bee tattoo on her wrist, and it's real similar to what the ones Mike was doing. She was out of town, so she went and had one done anyway. Um, this last month we also received another grant. We've been applying for grants as we did last year for native pollinators. This area of Northeast Florida has 94 species of bees and one of them is endemic to this area. So we had uh, one of our members build this native bee house that's out here in the corner in the gardens here uh, for us out of Cyprus. We applied for another grant. We just received another $2,000 grant for native pollinators for, for St. John's County. So we're going to launch something here in the next month or two. We're going to start talking to, to a couple of carpenters um, that are in our group to start building and talking about that and try to get some beehives in some other locations, some of these native beehives out there, uh, like at Guano Reserve and maybe down at uh, Favor Dykes, out the research lab out there in Hastings. So if anybody would like to participate in that and help out, that'd be greatly appreciated. I'd like to see who we can get involved um, with the native stuff, which would be kind of neat. Uh, I'm kind of excited about that program. Uh, the big news I think I have 
right now is November meeting next month. This is a voting precinct now, so which takes place on November 6th is voting midterm elections. We they will be setting up in this room on the 5th, so we get closed out as far as having our meeting here. We're allowed to use the wind mitigation building if we would like. It can handle about 35 people in that room. Um, I've been kind of leery about jumping on board because that's kind of what we're at now here with the, even on a rainy night, even last month, but with people like Jackie Post speaking, we had 71 people at that meeting on mead making. So we set kind of a world record. She um, <laughs> out participated Jamie Ellis with uh, participants. So I was really proud of that. But we're going to get phased out of the room so we don't have a, a, a location except wind mitigation. Talk to me. Um, the other thing is, is I did t what I did talk to was Ancient City Brewery over here on the Boulevard, and they offered. They said we could actually use their facility there. The, um, we have a speaker coming in. Is Jack or uh, Jen Jennifer Holmes, who's the president of the Florida State Beekeeping Association, and she's going to speak on products and hives, uh, different products and what's going on within them. Wraps and candles and bombs and salves and things like that. So she's going to be our guest speaker. Um, I wanted to throw it to the members to say, we, is there anything over, over at mosquito control? We have a boardroom that will hold. I would say like 50 people, 45, 50 people. No problem. So if you can't get in there or I mean somewhere else, okay. I mean, I'll run it past Rudy, I'm sure he. All right, there's that's Molly Clark from Mosquito Control, which is just right back here. So they've got a brand new facility there. So it's possible we could use a big room there or we go to Ancient City Brewery and possibly, I told them that I was willing to throw in, you know, funds to buy a, a pony cake or a cake. <laughs> <laughs> and after Jackie's response of, of people showing up, I, I have no problem with buying a keg of beer. Um, I want a growl. Yeah, yeah, so um, that's a possibility. So what do you think? Yes. We have a vote on what's the vote? Yes. Yeah. Ancient Arr. 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 Okay, I'll follow through with that. So it's just down the road. Right everybody passes it here, coming in and out. I remember everybody knows where it's at here on the right hand side. As we're coming in, you'll see the signs. It's got a real orange and yellow logo on it. They're usually closed on Mondays, but they agreed to have a, a staff member open it up and have a barkeep there for us. And, you know. I did understand that there was going to be, a, you know, something on the front side, cleaning and cleanup set up or whatever they do. So it's not a problem. They've got a real big open room. They've got a, an air-conditioned room that can handle about 30 people, but then they've got a big room where they do the brewery that's about this size that can handle it real easy. So I think it'd be kind of fun as kind of a mixer and let Jennifer do her talk. And, yeah, okay, sounds good. Here, here, put it down in the minutes. Ancient City Brewery for November meeting. Uh, as far as beekeeping goes, I say we need to start watching with your, your hives to start feeding bees. Right now we're kind of in between seasons. We're kind of winding down. Um, some areas, the goldenrods bloom it, so they're pulling a little bit of, of pollen off the goldenrod. They're not getting much nectar on that at all. Spanish needles going off like crazy. They're getting a lot of nectar on Spanish needle for the most part right now. A little bit of Brazilian pepper. Uh, if, it depends on location. Where my bees are, I don't have any pepper in that area at all, but they are bringing in a lot of uh, Spanish needle nectar. I'm seeing uh, one day they're, they're sucking a, a quart of sugar water down in a day, and then else in the next time it sits there for a week. So it's really varying on what's going on. What is a really black pollen? I don't know. I've heard that somebody else mentioned that the other day. Is some of the blacker, the blacker pollens? Yeah, until this week. I don't know. I don't know. This was black. Throw that, throw that question at George. Yeah, it's like black tar. Yeah. Yeah. Black tar. Yeah. 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 I thought it might be just. It might be propolis. It, it may just be some uh, resins from one of the trees, just a black resin. Could, um, what about light yellow? The lighter, uh, the lighter, it's probably the goldenrod. Because okay. the, uh, the real orange stuff yeah, is, is the Spanish, Spanish needle. Yeah. 
but I have seen some real white, some real light color stuff too. There are some other, uh, there's a couple other flowers that are out there that are not real. The white is palm, right? Yeah, some of the palms can be a real light yellow. Yeah. Then there's even a whiter white. Yeah, there's a snow white. Yeah, there's some snow white stuff that's coming in. There's a couple of, I've seen some other flowers. It's got real long petals on it and I don't, I can't think of the name offhand. Too bad Kim's not here, she would know what it is. But there are some other wildflowers out there that are producing flower, a little bit of pollen. There's not a lot of nectar out there, so make sure you're keeping sugar water close at hand. Like Dave, we were talking last month, it's kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. How long can you leave a jar of sugar water on a hive if they're not taking it? Does it go bad? You can leave it. It, it really starts fermenting. It takes quite a while for it to ferment, and they'll start turning it down. They won't. Okay. If you put a little bit of vitamin C powder, this is just pure ascorbic acid. Tiny, tiny bit that helps it um, not go moldy. And a tiny little bit of honeybee helps it. They say, uh, I think a quarter of a teaspoon or something. And what they say is far too much. You need a lot less than what they say. And it stops it going moldy. Also, sometimes you propolize the holes. Uh, you yeah, you check, you gotta, if they're not drinking it very fast, make sure your little holes are at least two little holes up in there. The lids that they sell have about 20 or 30 holes in them. I usually let them propolize that up and just get it down to that one or two holes. And if they're really drinking fast, let it go to one hole on there. But they'll get their tongues up there. It's amazing what they can drink and how fast if they really need it. So kind of be aware of that. Uh, we're all, I always try to leave some honey on the hives even right now. I always leave at least a super, three quarters of a super of honey on them, just in case I don't get around and all of a sudden they start and I can't, haven't gotten there that they're not going to stop. Varroa, it is Varroa season. So start thinking about that. That's why we have Cameron Jack coming in to give us another talk. He did it last year on the same subject and he's going to do a follow up on, on his research from last year. So start treating with whatever you need to. Uh, I get it all the time. If, if your mite roll, start doing your mite rolls, or I was hoping we'd have the weather would be a little bit more conducive that we could have done a mite roll even last month and this month, and we haven't been able to get to it, is start testing for those mites. Because if you don't, three months from now, that hive's going to go down. you got about three months. If those numbers are, that threshold is there, it's a good to do at this point. So uh, do a check on it. You try to rotate your whatever... Uh, treatment that you're going to use, rotate it from what you did last year so we don't set up resistance across there. Uh, get any extra supers on there that are empty, start getting them off. Beetles are still bad, they're coming in in, in droves. Um, Holly actually used, has been experimenting with some of the red lids and having really good results on it. Anybody heard of those? The, the red lids? It's something new that came out here this last six months ago. It's a plexiglass lid that's made out of red plexiglass. And the claims are that the beetles don't like and they resist it and they take off. And Holly's been testing them. She's got how many dozen? Ten. Ten up, ten hives. She's not seeing any beetles at all throughout the commons. So and she's actually been making her own up since the cost has been real high on these ones that are coming out. Camera, maybe you can address a little bit of that too, Camera. Have you heard anything about it? We have one. Uh, we just had one, which is not used. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but, but I mean, it, at least where we had them, when they were out in full sun, it didn't get hot. We had melt some wax, actually. Yeah. So we had to kind of move them back out in the shade, but they, they did okay. She's, yeah, she said she's been using a plastic inner cover on top of it. Instead of an inner cover, she's actually made one on a clear plex for it, so I don't know if that's helping with the buffers yeah, that may not. And she's using a more like a telescopic, she's been making them out. Yeah, ours was telescopic, but it did, we didn't really have an inner cover. Yeah. Just hot, can you imagine? Yeah. I thought beetles registered, you could see red, red and bees the same thing. Everything registers as black. Yeah, most insects don't see into the red spectrum. Yeah, their, their spectrum is, is reading. I don't know so much. Yeah, I, I was really curious about that. That's a question I wanted to throw at Jamie, Mr. Beetle expert. Um, split hives if necessary. I guess the last thing I got to say is split hives. If you need to split them, it's now's the time to get it done. 
Still getting calls on swarms. Swarms are going off, not a lot, but they're still going off. I'm getting a lot more calls on bees that are in structures now being, they went off about a month ago, and the bees are still swarming. And a lot of that can be due to the fact that Varroa is getting high. Those Varroa numbers start getting real high, those bees are gonna make a last ditch effort and abscond those colonies and look for some place to live that is less invasive with Varroa mites. So be aware of that. So check your bees, get that sugar roll test done, alcohol, wash, whatever you wanna do, test for mites, make sure you got honey on the sugar or sugar or honey on the on the bees and uh, split if you need to. All right. Um, our guest speaker tonight is Cameron. We can talk, we can have a full session here at the end. It is Cameron Jack, who's an instructor over at the B Lab in Gainesville. And you can do a follow up on his report from last year. All right. All right. So, here again, I've been here a couple times, and each time I've realized I've been talking about oxalic acid so much so that. A few weeks ago, since Diane at the department, she said, hey, it's the oxalic acid man. And I thought, oh, am I the oxalic acid man? That's what I've become now. So, is there a clicker? Uh, I didn't say we're this, but there, it looks like there's one in here, but I think there's two. Oh, maybe this is it. Yeah, this is it. All right, great. I think it's going on for one. It may be. So, so I just, I'm gonna give a little bit more of an introduction to myself, just so, uh, so at least you won't remember me as Alex Lecaster, necessarily. <laughs> so, I am, um, I actually, I always tell people I'm from Las Vegas, but I'm actually from a small town outside of Vegas. A little valley called Wyoming Valley, just off the north arm of Lake Mead. Has anybody been out there? Woo, yeah. It's exciting stuff. You can see, it's hard to tell from this picture, but I did not see the color green until I was like in college. So um, I had to, to learn about that. But my um, my grandpa was a, a sideliner beekeeper. So I kind of grew up around bees. Um, he ran about 150 colonies, but it was super, you know, it's crazy hot around in the Mojave Desert. You know, in the summer, it's about 120 degrees. Um, and it'll, It'll stay there for about for about a month straight, um, and so it's insanely hot. So it's not really great beekeeping at that time. So moved all the colonies up into the mountains in southern Utah, and, and uh, there were a lot of wildflower pastures out there, and make a lot of honey and supplement his income. Um, he even did a lot of extension events, and this was so I, I found all these pictures when I was applying for another job recently and and so I had to show them that like yeah this is it's in my it's in my blood it's my roots um, so I, I have a wife two kids I, I went to school at uh, did my undergrad at Southern Utah University which is a small liberal arts school they're really close to where my grandpa kept all those hives um, so it's familiar territory to me and then I did my master's work at Oregon State University where I uh, did, re did research on the honeybee gut pathogen, Nozema serrana. Um, and so my PhD work is in Varroa, my master's work is in Nozema, and so pretty much every talk that I am asked to give is really depressing. And <laughs> it's like to tell you that your colonies are going to die if you don't do certain things, right? So everybody else in my lab gets to teach about the fun, exciting things of beekeeping, and I like bring it down a little. Just Make it kind of sad. But anyways, I'm, I'm still a PhD student. I'm, I'm hoping to finish up uh, within the next year or so. But I actually got um, a new full-time faculty position about four months ago. Um, and it was pretty terrifying. I had to you know, present in front of all of my, you know, they were my professors. Now they're my colleagues, I guess. But um, really, Really kind of terrifying, but I, I got the job, and which is really exciting. So I get to now teach all of the beekeeping classes that are at UF, and with hopes that I can make some new beekeeping courses um, and hopefully create a beekeeping certificate 
program. So for beekeepers that are interested, what I'm, what I'm really envisioning here is something that prepares people for the industry. Because every, every university in the United States that has a Jamie Ellis, that has somebody that is a honeybee scientist, they usually do teach one class. And it's just called beekeeping. And how can you possibly condense such a huge, broad topic into one semester? So it's just about all the warm fuzziness of beekeeping, but it doesn't actually do much to prepare people to go out and be beekeepers. It's kind of just a general introduction of what it is. Um, and so my goal is to create something that will kind of train people how to be successful in that. And along with this position, I'm also the distance ed coordinator for the entomology and ecology department. So I, um, I basically work with all of the online students. So if any of you are interested in going back to school and getting a degree, then you just let me know. Um, hopefully I can convince you to, to stay in, in, in bees. So anyways, I'll, I'll give a quick introduction of Bro. I realize that a lot of you know a lot about this fest and, and have heard a little bit of what I thought you what I have to say tonight, but, but for those of you that are the newbies here, I wanted to still give an introduction to Baroa, and as Bo mentioned, it's, it's one of the most you know, serious um, problems that we have in beekeeping around the world, um, and it's, it, uh, it's been around here since 1987, so we've had you know over 30 years we've been dealing with this pest, and we still have a very difficult time controlling it. Um, and I, I won't necessarily get into it here at B College. I'm going to teach a class that's specifically on Varroa biology, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. But there's some recent research that has kind of come out and will be published soon um, that has, has been a really interesting set of studies where they've actually discovered that Varroa is not primarily feeding on hemolymph, um, which is the blood of the bees, which is what, since they were described in 1909, um, when they first described Varroa, Varroa, the mite, they just said, yep, they feed on the bee's blood. And then that just became matter of fact, common knowledge, but nobody actually looked at it until recently. And they found that they actually feed on the fat tissues, um, not the blood. So, you know, what does that mean for you as a beekeeper? Diddly, squat. Doesn't mean much. But what that, what that means to a researcher is that now, maybe we've been going about this wrong. Um, especially in terms of trying to rear the mites in the lab, which we've never been able to do. Uh, but that's probably because we've primarily been trying to feed them hemolymph, not fat. So maybe we can start to make some more important advances as we kind of speed up the research on Varroa. So it's kind of a big deal. But um, the damage that, that Varroa actually do is is actually pretty minimal if, if, they are, if there was no viruses involved. But the issue with Varroa is that they vector a lot of viruses, just like if we were all kind of trapped in this room and we had a bunch of mosquitoes everywhere. Molly could probably help us out with that. But if she wasn't here, there'd be mosquitoes everywhere and probably vectoring and passing viruses all over, right? So that's essentially what the, the mites are doing. And it's not necessarily that they are bringing in new viruses into the hive. It's just that they're, they're mostly passing viruses that are already existing in, inside there. So the most common that you'll probably see if, if you pay attention and you're looking is probably this deformed wing virus. That's by far the most prevalent, most common in the United States. Um, and, but there's certainly other viruses that are vectored by Varroa. Sac root is very common. And then there's just a, a whole bunch of viruses that you really can't detect or differentiate without molecular means. But they just basically cause these bees to get dark. They they shiver and shake, and they don't fly very well. They usually don't live very long. So um, so it's really the viruses that are the killer, not really the varroa. But there's no cure for viruses, as you know, right? There's no cure for human viruses or any viruses. It's it's about controlling the spread of that, and that's that's why control of varroa is so important. So varroa can spread. Um, through a number of, of different mechanisms, and part of that is just based on you know, what we're doing as beekeepers, and then due to the biology of the bees. So the bees will, I mean, you know, the natural 
method of reproduction is swarming. So if the colony splits in half, the swarms, they're going to most likely be bringing grow with them. Or um, bees often are, are drifting. We love our bees, but at the end of the day, they've got a brain of size less than one milligram, which is pretty small. So they make some mistakes too. We cut them a little bit of slack, but they're going to be going into different hives occasionally. And when you when you're drifting like that, you're you're it's likely that they're going to be passing some mites around as well. But then at the end, what we're doing as beekeepers, and it's not really our fault, this is just the method of beekeeping, is, is we're moving frames around a lot, uh, we're moving bees around a lot, and that just facilitates that spread of varroa. So a lot of you have seen this before, but this is, I, I haven't been able to find a better way to present this, so if you can find a better way, <coughs> But I, this is just a really great figure that demonstrates the life cycle of these mites. Um, this, the, the, the mites that you will see on your bees are all female. And the first mite that enters into a cell is called a foundress. And so what happens is these mites will detect the, the pheromones that these um, fifth instar larvae are giving off. So they're about to, to molt in and become pre-pupa. So they're giving off uh, a pheromone that these mites detect and they hurry and jump down into those cells and they actually kind of wedge themselves underneath the bee um, inside the brood food. They actually have kind of a snorkel as part of their mouth part so they can actually breathe while they're down underneath um, underneath these bees. And once that uh, that cell is capped and that, that bee stands up and becomes a pre-pupa, she finishes off all the brood food, and then that mite can can uh, start is free to roam about the cabin. So she starts moving around. She can lay uh, starts laying eggs, and um, the first egg that she lays will always be a male. And then every subsequent egg after that will always be female. And so what happens is that male son, the foundress's son, will then mate with all of their sisters, so all of the foundress's daughters, and that's the only re that's the only um, mating that they will do for the rest of their their lives. And so it's pretty amazing to me the amount of inbreeding that grow a you know practice. But first, I mean, they're not turning blue. They somehow kind of figured this out and, of the um, the whole inbreeding situation. And then what happens is once this bee is ready to emerge. She chews her way out of the cell and then she releases all those mites that are that have developed. Um, so usually what can happen is you'll have one female, that, this foundress that goes in, she can have up to six or seven reproductive cycles. And each time on a worker, this 12 day period from the time that this cell is capped to the time that this bee emerges, uh, there could be two daughters that are now mated and ready to begin their own reproductive cycle. So, uh, this is really, you can see how grow can really skyrocket fast. You could be doing your, your rolls one month and, and hardly see any mites, but then you kind of slack off because you don't see very many and then you check a couple months later and they just exploded. So you really kind of have to be paying attention. Back in the old days, you know, we would recommend, yeah, you should probably be checking your mites like twice a year, but like now, you should probably be checking your mites, I mean, here in Florida, really every other month, when there's not a complete um, you know, end to a queen's re like brood cycle. I mean, you really need to be on top of it and looking. Um, okay, I'm going to, I'll, I'll just give you this real quick. Yeah, this is what the males look like. You're not going to see, you're not going to see a row of male because they actually stay inside the cell and die. When that, when that bee emerges, these males will stay behind, and all the other <coughs> female mites that are not fully developed will stay in the cell and die. So you don't usually see these white ones because that means they're not fully um, sclerotized, they're not hard enough, they're not going to survive outside, so they stay in the cell and then they die. All right, I don't know, it looks like I totally put this in the wrong spot, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. Um, I thought I put it in at the beginning of this talk, but, but anyways. I, I wanted to just, uh, we're going to take a little time out and I'm going to tell you about some of the classes that I teach. Um, <laughs> so I teach a beekeeping class, which is this online class, uh, and it's really popular. We've been teaching it for, for years. 
uh, or Jamie's been teaching it for years now, I'm taking it over. Um, but this semester, I was telling Bo earlier today, I mean, we have 130 students, and it's just really hopping. And now with the new facilities, um, and we can kind of accommodate that many students and, and do, this Saturday we had a big field day for the class, and, and we were able to, to really uh, accommodate 130 students going in and out. We had like honey extraction, we had uh, one station where we were working bees, one station where we were building equipment. So this is, it. I'm, I'm really looking forward, and I hope some of you can come to B College um, and kind of see this new facility if you have been there already. But kind of going along the same vein of, of what I was saying before about how I want some of these classes to kind of help prepare people for the beekeeping industry. I mean, for instance, I want to have a class called the business of beekeeping, um, where we're actually working there. There, I've talked with a few commercial beekeepers that have that have uh, been said they are willing to come give like. Um, some guest lectures, and I think, you know, I'm not a commercial beekeeper, so it's kind of difficult for me to give you the nitty gritty on, on nook production, or queen production, um, or even honey production. So it, to have some experts in the field to actually come and teach that would be really beneficial. And we also, have, I mean, at the university we have, we can partner with people that are in like the food and resources and economics department. Um, you know, have somebody with an economic background to help teach you know, how to manage account, how to manage people. You know, those are the kind of things that you don't really get anywhere else. And that's what I'm really trying to hopefully develop through this certificate program. All right, time, time in. Sorry about that. I thought I'd put that at the beginning here. So, um, really, when we're, when we're talking about controlling Varroa, our options are, are fairly limited. We don't, we don't have a lot of really effective controls. We have a lot that beekeepers use, um, but there's not always a lot of scientific rigor that goes into deciding whether or not something is a really great product or not. Um, so unfortunately, kind of the way things are right now, most people are, are using chemical treatment because that's what available, is, is available to them. But the way that we, we've been so slow to kind of develop new products, we've been kind of rolling out new products one at a time, and unfortunately, you know, when you're, when you're, everybody in the United States is basically using the same product at the same time, we're gonna start running into some mite resistance issues. Um, and, and so two of the products, so Fluvalonate was the very first product, uh, or the active ingredient it was Fluvalonate, the chemical was Ap, uh, the trade name was Apistan. Um, everybody started using it and then stopped really working, stopped being effective. So then they rolled out something else. The active ingredient was Kumafos. The product name was Checkmite. Um, and you know everybody was using that. It stopped being very effective. Uh, for the last 10 years, probably, everybody's been using, well, people have been using Amitraz for a really long time. But in the last like six or seven years is when, um, or really, I think five years now I think about it, is everybody's been using Apivar. And guess what's happening? starting to see some resistance to it. It's not as widespread yet, but, but it's happening for sure. Um, so, I mean, beekeepers are just desperate for good, effective controls. Okay, so here's where I enter, here's where oxalic acid man enters the scene here. So, um, oxalic acid is, is, uh, a, is a plant ex extract, actually, um, that has been used for beekeeping for a long time, especially in Europe. Um, but it's only been legal uh, about in, in 2015, so, so three years ago. Um, there's a few different ways that it can be administered. A lot of people, at least traditionally, were mixing it into sugar syrup and then were using a syringe to kind of drizzle it in between the frames. Um, so thus getting it on the bodies of the bees, the bees are cleaning each other, and, then it's coming into contact with the mites, right? Um, so that's been kind of the most common and traditional way of using it. But in the last few years, there has been um, a, a large number of people in the United States that have, have focused on this method called vaporization, where, where if any of you that are chemists out there 
I mean, it's really sublimation. So you're taking this, you're taking this solid and you're you're turning it into a gas. Um, and and so you do that by basically placing it on a hot metal spoon and then putting it into the colony and it and it heats it, turns it into a liquid, then turns it into a gas, spreading the chemical throughout the colony. Um, but here's one little plug that I usually try to make every time I'm giving this talk is that um, so a lot of beekeepers really like oxalic acid because it is considered an organic treatment because it's derived from plants um, and it's not a synthetic chemical you know made in the lab however that doesn't mean that it's safe um, it doesn't mean that it's safe necessarily for you and it's certainly not safe for your bees when you're doing when you're, if you're doing it the wrong way. Um, but I would also argue that your health is much more important than your bees, and I love my bees. I mean, I, I'm a beekeeper just like you. I love my bees, but I would still value my own health over my bees' health. So um, really, if you're, if you're using this method, you, you have to, or oxalic acid, or really any chemical treatment, you should be making sure that you're taking proper Pro, uh, proper protective measures by at least wearing gloves. If you're vaporizing it, then you're turning it into a gas, then you have, you run the risk of breathing this in, and I've accidentally had a big whiff before, and I couldn't stop coughing for, you know, for about 30 minutes. I mean, it was really bad. So, don't do that. You know, and, and, it, and it, you can't just be wearing a dust particle. You need a, you need a real oxalic, or sorry, a real um, respirator. organic vapor. It's it's a real respirator, but it has to have the right filters, which is for organic vapors. So you're my free? No, but I'm, I'm going to show you that. You oh, I'm my free. Yeah. Well, I don't have them in my lungs. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm my free. Okay. So currently, the legal use of oxalic acid in terms of vaporization is one gram of oxalic acid per brood chamber. Um, and, you know, in, in the UK a few years ago, the effective dose that they were seeing for oxalic acid vaporization was two and a quarter grams per, that's per brood chamber, so per brood box. Two and a quarter grams, and we're like, wow, that's pretty, that's, uh, you know, much lower, so let's see if it's effective. If what the United States beekeepers have is, can even be effective. Well, like I said, European beekeepers have been using oxalic acid for much longer than we have, and, and uh, there, uh, there are a number of beekeepers, especially in Italy, that you that will basically use a method where you're you're caging the queen for a period of time, and you're trying to get rid of all the brood inside of the colony, thereby making sure that all the mites are on the bodies of the adult bees, right? So just like if you go think back to that mite reproduction slide that I had. At any given time, it's estimated that 70% of the mites that are in your colony are actually down in those brood cells, not on the bodies of the bees. And so if your colony is broodless, then this treatment would be much more effective because you're, you're increasing the exposure of the mites um, and to, to OA. And, and so the idea is you're caging the queen, getting the brood out of the colony, and then treating, and then ideally in one fell swoop, you should be able to knock down all the mites. So we want to determine whether we can couple these two things together. So I say artificial brood interruption. What I mean by that is we're caging the queen. We're causing brood inter interruption by pulling the queen out. All right, the queen wasn't out, but she was caged. Um, and then we wanted, obviously, to evaluate the health effects. So this is the, the research that I presented to you last year, and I didn't want to beat it to death, because um, you guys have already seen it. So basically, Real quick, all we had was we had six different groups where we had oxalic acid that was applied one time versus oxalic acid that was applied three times. The idea with three times, some beekeepers are, their their point is you don't need to have a queen or you don't need to have a broodless colony if you treat once a week for three weeks because then you will be uh, the mites that are down in those cells will eventually come out and then they'll be exposed if you're treating multiple times. So we wanted to test, so one application versus three applications versus no applications, and then these groups 
they had their queen stage and these ones didn't. And just as like a positive control, we wanted to use what the industry standard was. Uh, we used the ape of our strips, which is what everybody else is using, just for comparison. Um, so I don't want, I didn't want to give you all the data because that's kind of what I did last year. But what I wanted to just remind you of was was of this figure here. So this is the total, the colony survival. Survival at the end of the experiment, which the experiment ran for about three months. And I kind of hate showing this slide because it makes me look like a really terrible beekeeper. Because a lot of colonies died, as you can see. But I think it really tells, tells probably the best story here. So the one at the end where we only had one surviving colony at the end of this was the group where we just caged the queen. So we didn't provide any mite treatments. We just caged the queen so we got all the brood out of the colony for a period. But that was actually pretty hard on these bees, as you can imagine, to take, you know, uh, and we, were all, we only caged the queen for um, three and a half weeks, so 24 days, which is long enough that there should be no brood inside that colony. So it wasn't like we caged her for the whole three months, it was only for three and a half weeks. But that three and a half week setback really put these colonies in a bad position, especially when they had mites in the colony. So then let's look at the next little group. So we have oxalic acid that was treated once, but did not have a caged queen, was a little bit better than the ones that had their uh, caged queen and it was only treated once. And then, interestingly, very similar, the one that had oxalic acid uh, that was treated three times but was not caged did slightly better than the one that was treated three times and was caged. So it kind of looks from here that caging the queen did not really give us the effect that we wanted. In fact, it kind of hindered that it, it hurt more colonies um, than we wanted. And you can see that the Amitraz one, they all survived. They didn't all look perfect, but they all survived, which is pretty telling. Um, which means that this auxilic acid at one gram is not, not cutting it. And here's like what, this is the message that I don't want you to leave here tonight thinking that like, well, look at this control where he didn't do anything, survive just as well as when he treated three times. Yeah. My point is not that you shouldn't treat. It's just that this is not an effective treatment. At one gram per per brood chamber is not cutting it. And and I think I mean we feel we had ten colonies in each group. We feel pretty confident in, in making that statement that that one gram is just not doing it. So we went ahead last year. So this is all the the, the information that most of you haven't seen. Um, is this experiment that we did last fall, where we just, you know, I was just kind of leaving it there for a little bit because that's what I had said I was going to do for my PhD. And then, you know, Jamie and I were talking a while back when we, um, earlier in the spring of 2017, and we were just like, you know, we're kind of leaving everybody hanging. We kind of just said, yep, the legal limit doesn't work, but we're not really saying, you know, we're not finding out what works. You know, if we want this to be, something that can be usable for people so they have more options for their control. So we started to increase, we did another experiment where we increased the dose. So our, our objective was to find what the effective dose of OA vaporization would be. And then of course we wanted to see how that would affect colony health once we start increasing that OA. Like I said, it, it can be pretty rough stuff. So we want to make sure we're finding the level that is, is safe and appropriate. Um, so we had 10 colonies each. This time we didn't have as many colonies at our disposal as we had the previous year. But we had at least 40 good strong colonies that hadn't been treated for mites for a while. So, and so we kind of equalized the brood between them. So we, were pretty, we sampled them and we saw that there was no differences between these colonies and their mite levels. So it was about as even as we could possibly get it. And we we doubled the, the dose each time. So we had the current legal dose again at one gram. Then we had a treatment that was two grams and then a treatment that was four grams. And then we still had our untreated controls for comparison. Um, and so again, this time, we weren't bothering with caging at all. We weren't gonna cage that queen because we didn't see that was very effective and it, it kind of hurt more colonies than it helped. 
Now, I will say this before, because some beekeepers are very much of the mindset that they, they create a broodless colony and it does help. And I, and I don't dispute that. What I'm disputing is when we caged these in, in the 2016, we did not see good survival. It really hurt the colonies because they didn't have enough time to bounce back, really. Um, so anyways, we did this time, this experiment, we didn't cage, but we did do three treatments a week apart, <coughs> like we did before. Um, and then we measured mites. Uh, we like, I took a sample of mites and we looked at mite infestation rate at each of those time periods. Um, and then to make sure that this wasn't really harming the colony as a whole, we were estimating colony strength by uh, doing weekly visual uh, assessments where we were describing the percentage of the amount of bees that were covering a frame, the amount of brood, pollen, and honey that were all covering the frame. This is <coughs> is a, a fairly common practice in a lot of colony level studies. It's pretty standardized and, and compared to a lot of other honeybee studies. So um, here's what we saw. This was this was in terms of the number of mites per 100 bees. So we, as I told you, the 2016 study was done over three months. This time, we were really doing it in one month. So we, were, we actually didn't lose any of those colonies because we kept it a very short controlled experiment, which I think gave us some better answers. Um, so if you look again, this is the number of, we're looking here at the number of mites per 100 bees. So that's kind of the common way that you will kind of identify what your threshold mite levels are. Um, so here, the controls, I mean, the averages are above seven mites per 100 bees, which is really high. That's, I mean, that's dangerously high. These colonies probably even after that month were, were kind of on the edge where we needed to treat them pretty soon. So um, now the one gram of oxalic acid, you can see that it did drop that mite level. So this is the current legal dose, right? That we found that wasn't very effective the year before. We see that this level did drop when we did three treatments of the legal, legal dose, but they weren't, it wasn't statistically different anyways from the control. Um, now if we doubled that, we have two grams of OA, we do see a, we're at about three and a half mites per 100 bees, which is still above the threshold that you usually consider safe um, for your colonies. But it was significantly lower than the untreated controls, but not quite significantly different from the one gram. But then the four grams um, was down just below three, three mites per 100 bees, which is actually, that's to the point where you probably do need to do some treating. I mean, that's when it starts to kind of become serious. Like I said, these mite populations were, were pretty high. I mean, you compare, when you compare them to control. So, but what we do get from this is we are seeing uh, a drastic decrease in the overall when we increase the dosage. So now your question is, right, all right, well, now you're four times the legal limit. How is this affecting our bees? So here's what we found. Um, so like I said, we were measuring those bee, po the bee populations or the colonies strength each week for a month. And you do see a, drastic, uh, a, a gradual decline. Uh, but what we found after doing some, some math statistics here, we see that um, while they all do decline, that decline it probably has more to do with time because at, at no point were these ever statistically different from one another. None of the treatments were really different, but we see a decrease over time. That's probably because this was done in the fall when the queens are starting to slow down their, their production. That's even more um, pronounced when you're looking at the brood. Some of that message was pretty repeated from last year, but um, we're we're you know we really are trying our best to come up with practical answers for beekeepers, and we have a new. He's not pictured here because this is kind of an old photo, but is the most recent that we have of the lab. Um, but we have uh, an applied scientist that's here now, 
Some of you might know him as, as Umberto Von Cristiani. He's a great, great scientist and a good beekeeper. And his job, his full-time job, is to work with, with beekeepers and answer beekeeper questions. That's what I like to do, but now my full-time job is to teach. So I still do research, and I will continue to do research, um, but, but, but uh, he's, the, he's the man with the plan that's going to kind of hopefully come up with or, or you know, work with beekeepers to hopefully find some more solutions. So I guess with that, I'll just, we can just, I don't know how much time I have left, though, but we can. Uh, half hour. Half any, hour. Any thought of getting the vaporization through the cell wall, through the cap? Well, it's probably not going to happen with OA. The molecules are, are probably too big. Yeah. Uh -huh. And when I say molecules, I mean, I mean it's going to come out and, um, it's going to be, yeah, it's probably going to be just too big to like really get through the wax. There are some, like formic acid is the only control that I am aware of that even claims to have an effect inside the kept root cells. That said, formic acid, it can be pretty rough on your bees if not done properly. I mean, it's very volatile. I mean, it's, it, that's what it, it's for. I mean, so in Florida, it can be kind of tricky um, to really get the timing right on certain treatments that are just meant to be volatile chemicals. Because if it's too hot, that means it's releasing too much chemical at once, and you're going to drive your bees right out of the colony, or you're going to burn up the brood, which I've seen both happen. If it's too cold, then it's not releasing enough, and it's not doing anything. So formic acid is the only one that I know that is penetrating that. Good. I may have misunderstood the charts, but in your first study, it the survival rate was highest with the, what was the commercial treatment? Yeah, amateur yeah, right. mm -hmm. And then in the second study, you, did your control <coughs> have amateur I did, I'm sorry, I didn't treatment. explain that very well. I only, we only had enough colonies to do a negative control. Because we, and we thought that would be probably more useful in that study um, because we still wanted to see where those mite levels would be if we didn't treat. I understand that that was the reason for your study, the salad gas. But um, what what do you think about the the, um, the the survival rate of this number of mites? Do you still think that the commercial or whatever the agar was would be equally effective in the number of mites? So, so it it definitely reduces by a lot. I didn't show you all the. Uh, I didn't show you the data that I had, all of the data that I had from the 2016 study, but we actually did, we measured mites there as well, but the numbers were just kind of all over the place, except for amateurs. I mean, it consistently still dropped. Now, I say that, and, and a lot of commercial beekeepers that I'm talking to, I mean, I'm finding out from them that amateurs is, is becoming less effective for them, and it's, and it's so the mites are definitely starting to, to show some resistance. So that's why, I mean, it again adds to the desperation of trying to find something in addition. But that doesn't, I mean, really the idea, ultimately anyway, we want to be rotating our chemicals. So if Amitrax is still working, then I would say, I would still probably work that into a rotation every so often. Can you give us any tips on if we're going to try the oxalic acid? Have you got any thoughts and tips having used it so much yourself? So the Time tip of day, you know. My tip would probably be to uh, to weigh them out beforehand instead of trying to go out into the field and do it, and it kind of makes a mess. Um, and then if the wind blows and you spill some and then you lost it. So yeah, kind of, we, we just had like small little Ziploc bags or, or tubes or something that we had to weigh before we even got out to the field. There are, in terms of like actual vaporizers that people use, um, there are a number that you can buy, and, and here's the, like the really kind of bad situation here is that there's like really no regulation on any homemade device, and so you just got to be careful of like what you're buying. Um, some of them can get really hot really fast, and if you get oxalic acid too hot too fast, what you do is you actually you burn it and it creates formic acid and carbon monoxide. Um, and so when you're sealing, because 
I didn't I didn't really talk about the application too much, but when you're when you're putting in your ox, your vaporizer and you're basically you're hooking this to a car battery, it sounds really <laughs> really janky. I get that. So you're like, take your metal spoon and heat the crystals inside with your car battery. But um, but so you're you're hooking it to a 12 volt battery, and then it takes about with the with the brand that we use, which is called the Oxa Vape, is what that that brand of vaporizer we use. It took about two and a half minutes to even go down to, to you know, vaporize one gram. So with with three grams or, or four grams, it took about three minutes, three and a half minutes. Or something. Um, so. But you're plugging up that hive. You got to seal it up because, again, this is like a fumigant. You're 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 turning this into a gas. So if you've got screen bottom boards and you're just, or you've got a bunch of cracks and your lid doesn't fit on right and it's all coming out anyways, then it's not going to work up very well. So so inspect your colony beforehand. Make sure that it's you're kind of sealing off all the leaks. If not, you can just run some duct tape around the top of the lid or something and kind of kind of helps seal it in a little bit more. But you want the forages to be in there? Do you do wait to the you know what? We never waited until the evening to do it, um, and most of the mites are not going to be on the foragers. They're mostly going to be on the young nurse bees that are around the brood area because that's where they reproduce. So that's where you tend to see kind of the highest concentration of mites. So, two things, or a couple things. One, I think it was both saying because I do have screen bottom boards and I've just been putting like the white thing that you count your mites basically uh, underneath it and I will I actually reduce my honey supers before I do it is that necessary like I use a fume board I block the entrance lower them all down to the brood box and then I use the oxalic acid and treat which is time consuming but if I have a screen bottom board is that more effective or should I just like let it well, I definitely think, yeah, I mean, if you can slide something underneath that or on top of that screen bottom board to just close it off the best you can. But like you said, reducing, so taking off those honey supers is actually the law. I mean, you should be, you, you shouldn't be using any chemical treatment with honey supers on um, because it can contaminate the honey that you're trying to collect, right? So. You do want to do that, but then you also bring up a good point of just simply about reducing the brood size, or just like the space. I mean, if you're reducing the amount of space that you're putting on, then you're kind of concentrating more bees, which thereby you're exposing more mites, which is what what the goal should be. Um, the bees don't like this particularly. <laughs> so, I No, mean, you're right. It really does. I feel really bad because a lot of my beekeeping is urban beekeeping with other people who have land and let me put them on there and I say, hey, I'm going to treat for mites. I'm using oxalic acid. I show them, okay, here's my big ass long burner that I attached to my car battery. I'm going to burn some chemicals. I got a face mask. It yeah. looks like I'm burning some acid here but I'm treating for mites. It's, I mean, it's a little sketchy, but I have noticed Bo says he hasn't seen really any difference with the oxalic acid. But I feel like on the white bottom board that I, I do see... You see a drop. Yeah. But I know that we have to treat for several weeks that it's not as effective as just, or convenient as just hanging strips in your body. Well, it's not nearly as convenient. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we definitely, we definitely see, we, we uh, in the first 2016 study, we were measuring mites by using screen, or by like sticky boards on the bottom of our, of our colony. So we were looking at the drop, and we definitely see a, a a huge spike and drop every time you treat. Um, the second study, we were just doing mite infestation, right? We were just taking a sample of bees from the brood area and just counting the number of mites per bee on them. So we didn't see that drop. But we definitely, I mean, it it works. It will drop mites, um, but it doesn't necessarily, um, like you said, it, it's not incredibly effective <coughs> compared to other controls. But again, that's what we're trying to find that effective dose. You know, if, you, if we can find it and we can kind of get it closer to some other treatments, then you have at least another, you have another arrow in the quiver, right? You have something to start rotating and, and kind of take into, take into play. Anything with the uh, blue shot towels, the glycerin? So that one's kind of interesting. We, I have never personally done it. Um, 
I've seen it done, and I've there's been I've talked with several commercial beekeepers in Florida that have not had good success with it, that have used like Randy's recipe and, and did really good, very good success. Um, the Jamie Ellis of of uh, Alabama is at Auburn University. Jeff Williams, he tested it. They wanted to keep Delplane and Mike Hood. They didn't get much success. But I've heard other beekeepers um, in Maryland that that said it worked pretty well for them. Um, and then Randy Oliver, who's, uh, some of you might have read, read his blog post, the Scientific Beekeeping, he's, he said he's got a really great success so I don't know if it's regional or, uh, you know, based on climate, but so far from what I've heard, most of the reports around Florida have not. It hasn't been particularly successful. Well, what is what I was over in England, um, and I joined a beekeeping group, a local one in Norfolk there, and uh, they use oxalic acid all the time, and they say they're seeing not great results anymore. Really? Yeah. I haven't heard of any, like, resistance, really, I think their limit is just 2.25 grams or something, 2 or more grams, maybe it's just not enough. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, I know, that's just the mode of action of oxalic acid, so how is it actually killing mites, is actually still somewhat of a mystery. I mean, there's, we can see when you do like vaporization, you spread out that, that chemical on like a petri dish. Um, or even on the face of the comb sometimes, you can see that it gets stuck to like the, basically the suction, so mites have like a suction cup feet basically, and it gets stuck to the bottom of their feet and they just can't hold on, they fall off and die. But we're not, uh, if you topically apply it to the mite, it still kills the mite, and we're not sure what that mode of action is. The, the molecule itself is very similar to borax, and we're not sure if it just cuts up the, the cuticular membrane, makes it dry out, desiccate, um, or not both. So we're not exactly sure what the mode of action is still after all these years of oxalic acid. I see several sites through the media that promote a problem uh -huh. instead of vaporizing. Can you speak to the effect of this or that? Have you tried it? So I have, it was in conjunction, I, I just went with a commercial beekeeper, kind of shout out them for a day just to kind of see what they were doing. And it, I mean, you're talking like sketchy with the car battery, like you're really increasing that sketchy level when you've got, a, you've got your, your oxalic acid mixed in with alcohol and then you got a propane tank and you're like, oh, you're blowing, <laughs> blowing this like cloud of stuff. Like, Pretty close. I don't know. I, I I don't think there's been a lot of real good research that's been done to like see like how different it could be. But a lot of beekeepers use it and have had good results with it. I personally have never. I've never. I've used it with another commercial beekeeper, but not in my own colonies. So I don't have a better answer. What about combining amitraz with the oxalic acid vaporization? So, I, I haven't actually read anybody that's really doing that. Um, it's just a it's just a tricky game, right? I mean, this is the great challenge of controlling varroa: is you're trying to kill an arthropod that's on another arthropod, and so and I liken it to chemotherapy. I mean. You're putting in something toxic that's toxic to the bees, but also toxic to the mite, and it should be more toxic to the mite than it is to the bees, but it's all about finding that right balance, and if you start kind of making, putting in too much at once, then we're not really sure what that's going to do to bees, um, because certainly each of these chemicals have effect on the colonies immune, or the bees, like individual bee and colony level immune system. And so when you're putting in kind of too much, it could be a little bit much. That's not to say it's not effective, um, and it's, it's just something that really needs to be researched and, and looked at a little bit more. I mean, What's the I, age of the varroa mites versus bees? The age? Yeah. So they grow up together all their, you know, millions of years? 
Oh, well, um, Apis Serrat, it's been, so this Mycroata structure is actually, uh, its native host is the Asian honeybee, Apis Serrana. And so Apis Serrana and Varroa have, have been thought to have evolved together for thousands of years. Um, Apis mellifera, or so Apis, sorry, Varroa destructor has only been on Apis mellifera since it was first discovered in the late 50s. In, yeah, in the early 60s. In Kroniker's. Uh, uh, Kroniker's in, in Germany discovered it in the 70s. Yeah, the early in 70s. Europe it, was a, it got, made its way in the 70s and then in like China. So basically what happened is the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, is, is, it actually is not a problem, bro is not a problem for them because they've kind of learned how to balance out over these thousands Apis of years. Apis serrana is a much larger bee, so yeah. it can handle so they were real tolerant of it. <coughs> and and so, African bees can tolerate it too because they're so much more aggressive, defensive. Yeah, they're definitely more defensive. They're more hygienic. They're much more hygienic. So I think like we bred our cows with some Brahma, maybe we need to breed our bees. Well, so there's been a big effort to try to breed Apis mellifera with Apis serrana, but they're two different species. Yeah. They're not talking. No, I mean, you know, Russian or, you know, just make them a little more husky. Well, <laughs> There's actually a lot of effort to breed more hygienic bees. There's just some trade-offs. Um, most people that I know that keep, like Russians, for instance, yeah. they think they're meaner than most of the African guys. Well, I mean, they, 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 apparently, those <laughs> the traits of being hygienic and being defensive are pretty closely linked. And there's only like certain cases where they they found some bees that are really hygienic that are not well defensive. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Anything <coughs> new and promising on the horizon other than you know the oxalic acid? Anything else that's coming up that's being tested? So I'm I'm right now I'm I'm trying to screen a few more uh, compounds that uh, that we have a, a toxicologist in our department. Um, who has like a few chemicals that have never been really uh, patented, but that have been effective for killing other other insects and other mites. Not necessarily the same type of mites, but other mites. And so we're going to try to kind of do that in the lab and see, you know, what the what the varroa cytal activity. So how much is it killing varroa? But we're doing it in glass vials. So now here's our big hang up. Again, I kind of said this at the beginning of, of my talk is that because we can't culture and rear mites in the lab, we are really limited on the amount of studies that we can do each year. So we're limited by the amount of row that we have. Because if we let our row levels get too high, then our colonies die. And then we don't have any. Well, and come over to my house, get a bunch. See, well, that's what people say, but then that's money for me, unless you're going to ship them to me, overnight them to me. It's going to be hard to get all those mites to, to be doing all the work, and so, and so until we can get something in the lab where we can really do some high throughput screenings, it's going to be tough. Well, um, this this your talk has really made us aware on both sides of using this product, and most uh, people shouldn't be using it because it's too dangerous for them to be messing with. Well, if you're not doing it right, it's just like yeah. driving a car, right? That's I mean, why I think we need a field crew. You know, that's been trained and to go around to each talking to Bo about that, doing it here. Make our own little crew up and we'll just go to everybody's hives and do it for them. And uh, people with medical background. I got the mask. <laughs> They're doing some research with RNAi research with, with protein receptors. That's what Jerry Hayes, when he left Florida to go to Monsanto to work with, was RNA which was part of B logic was a group out of Miami, the Israelis, and it came up with, it's uh, turning on protein receptors in the mice, turning them on or off. And so it was all about the delivery system of how do you do that with these mice. So the jury went to Monsanto, but now Monsanto's been bought up by Bayer Bayer. So he's out of there now. And he's actually gonna start working for Vita out of Europe. So it's kind of, hopefully, they yeah. come up with a delivery system that will be effective. It, it, right now they can do it, and they found it's effective to turn on these protein receptors in the mites to kill them or not let them reproduce. 
but it's a real cost. So that's the whole thing. He thought Monsanto would have the, the money behind it yeah. that they could do this research. And if anybody knows delivery <coughs> of chemicals, it would be Monsanto. Yeah. But after I don't know how many years, yeah. ten years, yeah. ten years yeah. he did, he did, yeah. So instead of poisoning them, feed them. Feed them. Feed them. Feed them. Yeah, feed them something that would turn, you know, turn this the RNA on. Not a lot of but it hasn't yeah. happened yet. Well, they have. They did. A, they were in the middle of some. I mean, they, it's all. It's a private company, right? right. So they, it's not like they're publishing. We this. can't find out. And, and they, they may have. They may have the answer. Well, the hearsay <laughs> is that that they've been doing a lot of of like field testing the last couple of years and it's been it's just they what the the effective rate that they're seeing in the lab is just not quite as effective it's just all about still finding out the right delivery right and and maybe this comes back to where where delivering it through the hemolin versus fat tissue might might make a Same difference here. so that's a, a practical application that that's just been discovered this whole thing with the fat tissue just been discovered by a, a young researcher uh, uh ramsey and he's actually going to be at B College here. He's going to be one of the speakers here in Gainesville coming up. So he's just discovered it. He just got hired on by uh, USDA in Beltville. So this is like real cutting edge stuff. <coughs> awesome. Did you Thank you so much for coming. So, uh, <laughs> we're going to talk that quick. <laughs> we're talk so your okay. first, okay. uh, first uh, research, you said it went on long. Did you do repeat treatments, and if so, how many treatments? So we did, like I said, that, I mean, there were certain groups that had one treatment, and that was still done at that. You didn't do three, many sets of treatments. No, 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 we did. We just did one at the beginning, and we just carried. So we did like that experiment, and then we followed it for longer. Oh, we I followed see. it yeah. for two at, like additional months. Yeah. So if you are, are you thinking about doing multiple treatments in sense? but then wait a month or two and then do repeat treatments throughout the year to see if it is more effective. So certainly that's a uh, would be a good experiment to find what's the optimal timing of these treatments. Mm -hmm. um, that's just something that's going to have to come with when we get some more money. <laughs> oh, and then I can then talk some under treatments and after you have your money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Definitely. I mean, it, that's the thing is you gotta. All of your treatments have to be timed around your honey flows, right? Your big nectar flows. So, so that's that's kind of. But that's that's really like the next step. Are these all double blind studies? Huh? Are these all double blind studies? No, because I need to know what they are so I know what to do. But but um, we do some double blind studies, but not with this. I mean, really. It, it it wouldn't make when we're when we're taking we're collecting a sample we're taking it back to the lab so I guess it would be blind for the people that are doing the mite washes they don't know oh, okay. but I know so yeah. if you're going to treat with the amitraz usually you treat like now like I say if you got honey on there you usually leave some honey on there you treat read the labels like am, am, the apivar it's in there, it's got a set a number of days, 45 days it's in there. Try to get as close to that as you can. The honey that's on there is for the bees, yeah. which is kind of like through the winter anyway. And the bees are going to be eating and consuming any chemical that possibly would be in in that honey. Is a full super of honey usually enough in this I, I'd leave I leave a full super on there. In fact, I left probably a little bit more than that on there. When I pulled honey off and threw my wets back on, they filled them up again. So some of them have two almost three supers of honey. I'm just leaving it on there because I know they'll consume it, you know, in the next month. Or, or I can take that and move it over to one that's completely gone so I can move those supers around my colonies if I need to feed them in case I'm not around. How or it gets to move those strips um, to where the half brood is? Or, or do you ever, I mean, Sometimes I'll go in every couple of weeks and just move them around to where I see more of the captures. Is it important? Not, not, really, not really necessary. No, the bees move around everything because they're all they share everything in the colony. Yeah. So chemicals, just like the queen pheromones, they're passed around constantly. So any of that people bar that you know, you know the trash that's on from the strips is going to be passed around. That's the whole idea, especially around that brood chamber, right where the babies are being born. And this time of year, the brood chamber is getting smaller and smaller, 
as daylights, we're losing daylight. And, and honey flow is slowing down. So everything's kind of condensing. Can I do a split right Yeah. Yeah, you can do a split right now. I did one for somebody the other day. But I mean, you're, you're getting iffy with your queens because there's not as many drones around. But he had a lot of drones in his hive, and I mean, it was wanting to swarm anyway. So it was. So buy a queen? Buying a queen would be the best because then you're, you're, st you're right up and running right away. And in fact, I, you'd like to buy queens in the fall anyway, generally, because it's going to get your hives real and strong for the spring. Having a new queen. Yeah, one of my suggested to do that, just in case, in case something happens. Yeah, have oh, absolutely. I think you know, two hives are always better than one. And take that split and put it right where your parent colony, move your parent colony away and put your split right there. So all those field bees that are coming back are just going to jump those numbers. Those field bees know where to go. All right, prior. I just came back from uh, Massachusetts, or uh, Maine. <clears throat> they had their <coughs> hive stacked eight high. They had like six side by side, eight high. Wow. He says, yeah, I just come back. Come back in the spring, harvest it all. He says, he's got burrow mites too up there. Yeah, well, they got a burrow everywhere. Yeah. Does yeah, it sure. not give them too much space? It can give them too much. It can be. 